So we're looking at Revelations chapter 20, verse 11. The battle of Armageddon has happened. The thousand-year reign has happened. That's the utopia on earth. Satan has been turned loose because, remember, he was bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. God's turned him loose, and he's gone out and gathered this army, and God took that army that was numbered like the sand in the sea, and he scorched them to death. Now he's taken Satan, and he has put him in the lake of fire, along with the Antichrist and all the rest of the gang. And they are there being tormented, what the Bible says, day and night. Then what happens is, verse 11, this great white throne judgment. Let's pick up here. John said, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. That would be Jesus. Whose face, the earth and the heaven, fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, which means he just saw groups that were in just smaller groups and in a lot larger groups numerically, stand before God, and the books were open. And it says, and another book was open, which is the book of life. Now, you have to know that there are some books that are mentioned throughout the Scriptures. And we also have record that there is a book of remembrance that God has made reference to. It does not, it's not identified here what the name of this book is, but we do know there is a book of remembrance. So, then we also have to understand the setting. This is the great white throne judgment. Now, if you notice... All these other judgments here are happening, but this great white throne judgment, we're about to notice who the audience of this particular judgment is. It says that in, in in this other book, and the book of life, so there's two books that God will bring. So just imagine when the judge is there, he will bring two books and open them up. One of them, of course, we know is the book of life. And it says, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Now I want to stop there for a moment. Revelations can be complicated if you let it be. But you have to remember tonight, you've got the greatest teacher ever. The Holy Spirit, not me. The Bible teaches us the Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher. That's what Jesus Christ said himself. There's no better teacher, no better professor, no better anything. All of those things are are great compliments if indeed they're done in the right way. But the greatest teacher is the Holy Spirit. Now, What has happened up to this point is the rapture's taken place long before this. So that meant that everybody who was here, all the bodies on the earth that were resurrected, those were all God-believing people, all right, The, the saved. I can't use the word Christians because in the Old Testament they weren't referred to as Christians. So a lot of the time... I can't say just Christians because anybody prior to Christ was never referred to. They never heard the word Christian. It was only in the New Testament. Now, we would refer to them as Christian people now, but you have to understand that word was not used. In fact, they used the word Messiah where we use the word Christ, but they mean the same thing. It's just different between the Hebrew in Messiah and the Greek in Christ. They both mean the promised one. Well, in all of those prior to Christ that believed and followed and obeyed God, and all of those after the time of Christ, we as Christians up to this current moment, would be raptured. 
That means that Adam and Eve, starting with them right on up till this very moment, if God came tonight, the rapture would take place and every God-believing Christian would be resurrected that has died in Christ or in God prior <clears throat> to this moment. Everybody. And at the same time, every believing Christian or every believer in God would be resurrected. So there would no longer be on earth any God-believing or any bodies of those who have died. That resurrection's happened. Now what happens is we see where there are those who will get saved after the church is raptured. There will be many people get saved. But in that process, there's going to be a lot of people get killed because they're going to be martyrs. And they're going to live for their faith. And we've already read and talked about that. They're going to die. And then what's going to happen is, when Jesus comes, for the beginning of the, of the millennial reign, the thousand years, so the battle of Armageddon has happened, and now it's time for the thousand year reign of Christ, and he binds Satan. Remember the Antichrist done got killed at the beginning of the Armageddon. He's already been put in hell. But now Jesus is going to resurrect all of those believers that came to know Christ after the rapture. So there's a second resurrection. And now all of those are resurrected. Are you halfway with me? Say amen. Now the thousand-year reign is done. He turns Satan loose. Satan goes to to, to Magog and he gets Gog the leader of Magog and he gets them and they bring out an army and they're leading the charge against against Jesus Christ because Jesus is here on earth along with the army of God which is will be us and the Lord doesn't even open his mouth as he did in the battle of Armageddon and speak death unto those it just says that the sun he will allow the issue in to scorch that entire army and they'll just burn up and Satan will be cast then into the lake of fire. He's done. He's done. He'll never come back. No more devil. He's done. God could kill him, but God wants him to suffer. So he keeps him alive and tortures him forever. <clears throat> so he'll get what's coming to him. God will repay. Now, now the Lord says, okay, I have raised all of my believers in the first resurrection and in the second resurrection, those who were prior to the Antichrist and those who have been since the Antichrist. Every believer and every body of every believer has been unified, glorified, justified. You are with me. And now he says, it's time for the great white throne judgment. Now, he's about to raise every lost person from the dead. And if you know at this point, here's what you can know. There are no more lost people living on earth because he has now annihilated them all. So every single one that's lost will have to be raised from the dead. It won't be like believers. Like right now, there's believers here, and God will raise the dead, and he'll also raise us too if we're still living. There are no more bad people living at this time, so he'll raise all the dead. Now watch this. <clears throat> After all of the time and all that has spent, and all of Revelation, and all the end of times, Let's just say, for example, I'm not judging anybody, but let's just say Cain was, Cain was a bad man. Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. Then they go on to have Seth, and on and on we go. But Cain was a bad man. So we know that <clears throat> Cain killed Abel. Let's just say for a minute that Cain did not get right with God. And let's just say that Cain was the first man to die and go to hell. Let's just say that. He could have been the first one to go to hell. Let's just say. 
All right? In that respect, Cain's body is buried on this earth right now. And Cain's soul is in hell. And everyone that has followed him in death since then, and all of those who have just recently died at Armageddon, and all those who just recently died from Magog, that Satan just went and got them all together, all of them just slipped into hell. And all their bodies are here. God is going to say, all right, now it's time for hell to empty every lost soul. And I want their bodies. That's why he said the sea will give up the dead. You know there are no souls in the sea. What he's trying to do is paint a picture. Where every lost body is, it will reunite with the soul. Now, mind you, now, all this time, Cain's soul has been in hell and his body is here. I will also go as far to tell you that even though Cain has been in hell, it does not mean that he's been in the lake of fire since he's been in hell. But though he has been tormented, like the rich man was in the book of Luke by the flame. You can be tormented by a flame and not be sitting inside the campfire. I can be tormented by the flame in a barrel but not be in it. So there's a greater punishment coming. But God now wants their bodies to be reunited with their souls so they can all stand before him and he can judge them. Now, the good news is you will not be a part of being judged at the great white throne judgment. And church, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to cut a flip one of these days if we do not feel the gravity of the love of Jesus and turn around and love him back when we begin to understand more about what we have already escaped. Because I, don't, I never will have to worry about standing before that great white throne. Nobody in here tonight that has been washed in the blood will ever have to worry about standing before that great white throne. The blood has covered you. And that, that's what gets me. When you ever hear about the blood or you sing a song about the blood, don't sing the words. Sing to the Savior. You'll sing differently. And truth is, it won't matter what you're used to or about what you're about to get used to. When you start singing about that name, Jesus, or that blood, sing to him. I mean, sometimes you ought to just rear back sometime and cut them loose. Amen? Turn the dogs loose. I mean, sing it into the heaven. Amen? And if you, you are not singing until your neighbor kind of looks at you like that. You've yet to sing unless that's happened. You've yet to sing. All right? But what happens is now they're coming and they, they're showing up and all the dead is arriving now. Watch this. Now, if you, if you would, can I say this? You have to look at the other side of the story for a minute. Satan visits. I mean, he, hell is not his home as it is, but he's, he, he frequently visits hell even now. All right? He's aware of that. What's going to be really weird is, is even though Satan wasn't bound to hell but could visit hell, this is going to be the one time that he'll be in hell all by himself along with the Antichrist and the other two, the prophet, uh, the, the one of religion and the one of the political uh, ring. So what's going to end up happening when Jesus pulls every one of them souls? Look at what, it, what you don't hear, but you have enough sense to know. Watch what's happening. Satan's going to be in there, even though he just got cast into hell, he's going to see all those souls, and there's going to be somewhat of an evil laugh. Well, I got all of these. And just for a minute there, God's going to say, Whoosh. and Satan's going to be laying in the lake of fire with him, the Antichrist, the, the politician, and the preacher. And then we'll be the only four laying in the fire. That's going to, you see what I'm saying? It's just... Hard to imagine and fathom, but that's exactly what happened. But that's where sometimes you've got to look at the other side of the Scripture and see what it's saying, but it's not saying it specifically. But we have enough sense to know if he empties every soul, who's left? 
That's what I love. That's the way I like to look at Scripture. Let me look around that corner a little bit. I want to see a little bit more than what these other people are talking about. Because these other people, they bore me. I, I want to see more. <clears throat> I done heard it. I want, I want more. So then what happens is he gets in there and verse uh, 14 happens. It said, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, I need you to listen to me real close here right now, because this is where some of you will agree with me, and this is where some of you will disagree with me. But that's just how we roll. There are some people who believe. And now, now listen to me now. You need to go dig this and prove this right or wrong, all right? Because I will not intentionally lead you astray. But you need, to go, you need to go dig this up, all right? Don't base this on just what your grandmama told you. I love your grandmama. I'm going to meet her one day. But I want you to base this on thus saith the word of God, all right? When he says that whoever's name was not found in the Lamb's book of life, he said he'll cast them into the lake of fire. There are some who believe that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life when you get saved. Then there's some who believe that the Lamb, your name was already in the Lamb's book of life and it can be removed. Truth is, by the word of God, every single name that had ever been created by the Father, their name has at least once been written. At one time, everybody's name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, some people would disagree with that. They'll say, no, no your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life unless you get saved. I will argue that with you. Now, I won't do it long because there ain't no need in talking about me being right and you being wrong. No, I'm just kidding. But, but it's just talking about God's word. You know what I'm saying? I mean, everybody got a right to be wrong. But what I'm saying is, but I will tell you this, I was taught all my life growing up that your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life when you got saved. But that is not the case. You search the scriptures and you find it. <clears throat> Your every name was written into the Lamb's Book of Life. You want to know why? Because that was always the Father's will. Why would a son die? For did he say they died for half the world, or did he die for the whole world? Was hell ever created for man? It was only created for Satan and his followers. What has happened is the name will be blotted out. All right? You remember what Moses said? He begged with the Lord. He said, Lord, before you take these people and you wipe them out, he said, blot my name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. He said, blot it out. All right? And then it becomes, ready, if you want to get deeper, a blood, the blood of a, of a goat or a lamb or a bull cannot put your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. But the blood of the Lamb of God Jesus Christ came long after Moses. So therefore, Jesus Christ could only validate or give validity to the blood of a bull or a goat only after the blood that was shed on the cross. But how could Moses' name be written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Because there was no validity. The only thing that then would have put Moses' name in the Lamb's Book of Life would have only happened if he'd been obedient and then Jesus Christ did what he did on the cross. 
then Moses' name could have been penned in the Lamb's book of life. But Moses said, blot my name out. Now, I'm going to tell you right now. You want to talk about a man who loved his congregation? To say, Lord, before you harm them, take my name out of the book that's going to put me in the kingdom and write it where I will be placed in hell. That's strong. And Moses knew if his name wasn't written in the book that he would be standing at the great white throne judgment. He knew. When, when he gets here, these people's names are not found. Can I ask you a question? When you look for your car keys, you have your car keys because you have a car. Have you, have you ever lost your car keys? Say amen. I'm going to ask you another question. Have you ever found your keys to your Lamborghini? Have you ever lost your keys to your Lamborghini? You know why you never had to look for them? Because you never had it there. The names can't be found, but he's looking for them because they were once there. You're not going to look for something that's not there. I mean, I guarantee you will not walk out tomorrow morning, walk out of your house, and, and, and call the police and say, Somebody drove my Maserati or my Royals Royce slam out my garage last night. Because they're not one there. Amen? And if they is, I want to know why these tires are so low. <laughs> Amen, somebody. All right? But, 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 but what I'm saying is, you're not going to look for something if you know it's not there. Do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm saying here is these names were pinned. They were then removed. And what removes those names is, and I'm going to tell you what it says about your God too, that he believes we've got everything it takes to get into the kingdom. It's only left up to us to erase our name. And now what happens is he looks for this name. Look at verse 1 of 21. He said, I saw a heaven and a new earth. And the first heaven, and it says, and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, this was a great question that I got last Wednesday night. It says that when, when Jesus said in John chapter 14, he says, you know, um, you know don't, don't let your hearts be troubled. Um, I think it's John chapter 14. But he says, let your heart not be troubled. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't say so. He said, but in my Father's house, there are many mansions. And I think it's like verses 1 through 6 there. And he's going to prepare a place for us. What we have to understand is that Heaven is actually going to end up being right here on earth. This is where heaven's going to be. But if you notice, Jesus has purged everything by this point. Everything's been purged and cleansed. There's, there's no, notice what he just did. He just had all of these people raptured and brought up for the great white throne judgment. And just as soon as they walk through there, everybody who goes to the great white throne judgment there, he takes all of those and he just placed them all right into the, to the lake of fire in hell. And the Bible says that's what you call the second death. Now remember, the first death is the physical death. The second death is now being placed in the lake of fire. Now, but understand, you do not die. So when it says second death, it is the death of actually now being judged by Jesus 
being separated by God and placed in the lake of fire forever. That's what he calls the second death. So don't think that someone's just going to be placed into hell and the fire will consume them and that's it. It will never end. It will never end. Eternity. Let me tell you. You know how we talk about soul winning on Sunday mornings? If you could think about how a lost person is going to spend eternity in hell and go through this judgment and be tormented forever and it never stops, it would change your witness. It would change my witness. Because how many people died in Florence County in the past month that are now in this awful place we called hell? Numerous ones, I'm sure. Ones you have walked by and drove by and you've even seen them. You just don't know it. And they're in hell right now. And they can never escape that. What then begins to happen is you, you understand the gravity of that. And I'm going to tell you, when you can think on things like that, it'll make you treat people differently. It really will. Because there's a lot of people that can run a lot of people off. And I think sometimes you might be got too high and mighty about going to heaven that you don't give enough thought about the people that's going to spend eternity in hell. And Jesus just didn't talk about heaven a whole lot. But he talked about hell over and over and over. We have to be careful how we, how we treat people. And then we have to make sure that we're not careful sometimes that we will engage in and entreat people with the gospel. We need to share the gospel. It's important. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you, the thing that we've got to get out of our mouth is, I'm not worthy. Listen, you're not worthy, I'm not worthy, we're not worthy. But he says we're worthy. You're not righteous, I'm not righteous, we're not righteous, but he says we are righteous. You don't have a plan, I don't have a plan, we don't have a plan, but he says we have a plan. See, sometimes we have to let our minds be overridden by the very fact that God has said it and that settles it. And we have to trust that. We have to trust that. You don't have to under listen, if you ever got if you think you've got to get to the point to where you understand it, then you're not trusting God. Because you're never going to understand God. You'll understand some things about God, but you're never going to understand it. I'll never understand it. Billy Graham didn't understand it. He understood some things about God, but even God tells us we don't need to give a whole lot of thought to those things because we don't have the mental capacity. But we do have the mental capacity to trust what God says. We do have that. And so when he goes on, he says here, verse 2, And John said, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. This is chapter 21 coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Boy, if we knew what that statement meant right there. But it says, And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And behold, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these things are word. Words are true 
and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son or daughter. How powerful is that? <clears throat> you know, see, what will happen is Jesus was talking about how they go and prepare a place for us. He was talking about the new Jerusalem. And in this new Jerusalem, this new Jerusalem is going to descend. See, what you've got to know is there is a city in heaven. And in that city, that city will descend and it will come down. And, and can I tell you where new Jerusalem is going to be? Where the old Jerusalem is. <laughs> Amen. If you put a new roof on your house, it went right where the old roof used to be to. Amen. Some people say, wonder where it's going to be. Is it going to be in Coward, South Carolina? No, no, no. <laughs> hey, no. <laughs> the New Jerusalem. You know, a lot of people, they try to figure this stuff out, man. I mean, I'm sorry, they start Googling. They start going crazy. Wonder where that New Jerusalem going to be to. The New Jerusalem going to be where the old Jerusalem is. That's where we complicate things so terribly. And so what will happen is God's got this new city and it's there, prepared, and, and all of these things. And then what we'll do is we'll get into it now because <clears throat> I know we got school tomorrow and it's 7.59, so we're going to close. And, but, you know, there will be a wonderful description of this. Now, mind you now, chapter 22, we're in chapter 21. Chapter 22 concludes the study of Revelations, all right? And, and, and I understand that, you know, some, some, some didn't come back, you know, for the second round because they think they figured it out in the first round. But I can tell you how I know they didn't because I didn't even get it in the first round and I'm the one that taught it. And so I can tell you them ones that came one time, they about halfway home. You know what I'm saying? That's a bad place for your car to stop too. But anyway, nonetheless, for those know-it-all, but I'm telling you right now, this, this is a powerful study of revelations, and it will help you in so many different ways in your life. And it's amazing that what's coming is so applicable to what's happening. It, it is really, really awesome how God works in such a mighty way. So I appreciate your patience, those of you that's been able to be through it, and those who have just recently come. That's a wonderful thing. And um, when we look at this here, uh, I just want you to focus on this tonight here. <clears throat> Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And, and because of that, and the blood that has been shed, gives us the validation and the justif justification. But we can't forget the mortification. We don't talk about the mortification much, but the mortification is you and I have to be dead to the old man. And there's some times that I and you, we may perform, try to perform CPR and dig them up and resurrect them. But that mortification is a sign of that salvation and that justification in our life. We have to be dead to that. But watch this here. Being dead to who we are in the flesh. <clears throat> the more dead we are to the flesh, the more alive we will be in the spirit. And so that's so important that we suppress this. And this. Remember, there's two dogs that live in you. A good dog and a bad dog. Whichever one you feed the most is the one that's going to be large and in charge. Now I'm going to tell you, both of them going to survive because the Bible says there will be a battle to the end. But just remember, we need to feed the good dog more than we feed the bad dog. And that's about as simple as I can break it down in Effingham, South Kakalaki. Amen? Let us stand together.